Bom dia. Um, é um, um prazer acolher vocês para mais uma USP Lecture. Uh, eu sou Paulo Nussensweig, atualmente estou o pró-reitor de pesquisa e inovação da universidade. Como nós temos um convidado hoje uh, da Universidade de Colômbia, eu vou fazer a apresentação em inglês. Um, so it's a great pleasure to um, start again, have a new uh, episode of this series, uh, USP Lectures. Um, we try to foster a good academic environment throughout the university, having distinguished guest lecturers here. Um, I think the uh, subject of this lecture is extremely important and extremely relevant today. Uh, and uh, I think one of the main things in, in our life as academics is precisely to value um, what we don't know. Once we know what we don't know, it's much easier to actually learn something. And uh, in that sense, I actually want to, to remember something. Um, my, my father, who some of you may know as a scientist, His PhD advisor uh, was an Austrian scientist called Guido Beck, to whom I refer as Grandpa Guido Beck. And uh, he liked to say that he was always um, very surprised at the willingness, at the anxiousness some people had to widely share their don't know how. Um, he passed in 1988, and I think that today we can all realize how prescient that was. So without further ado, I would like to ask Dr. Natalia Pasternak, who is the head of the Instituto Questão de Ciência, um, who kindly invited Professor Feilstein for his uh, stay, a two-week stay in Brazil. Um, so she will tell us a little bit about this, and then we will have an introduction to Professor Feilstein. So welcome to the USP lecture of today. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, so welcome, thank you for coming. And I could say a lot of things about Stuart, but I think the most important thing is that he really welcomed me into Columbia University, so I'm really happy that now I can welcome him here at the University of Sao Paulo, which was my home for like 20 years or so. So, uh, Professor Feierstein has been working as a neuroscientist for most of his life, but today he's going to talk to us about ignorance, failure, and uncertainty, which is how I met him through his work with science communication, and now we are working together in how little we don't know about science communication and science and how to talk to people. But there is a person who can introduce Professor Firestone much better than I can because he himself has worked with ignorance in social sciences and is a PhD from this university. So uh, I'd like to call Dr. Lenin Bikudu to introduce the Professor Firestone properly. Thank you, Natalia. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really glad and honored to introduce uh, Professor Stuart Feinstein to you. And well, since he will talk about ignorance this morning, I will start by saying that I um, did not know Stuart uh, in person up until now. I do know something about his work, and I am as eager as you to, know, to hear what he has prepared for us today. Stuart Feierstein is a neurobiologist and the chair of the Department of Biological Sciences at the Columbia University in New York. He runs a lab dedicated to researching the sense of smell, olfaction. And he is not only a very accomplished neurobiologist, but also, as Natalia pointed out, an equally accomplished science communicator. His books, Ignorance, How It Dri Drives Science, and Failure, why science is so successful, they both offer a refreshing take on the scientific method, and they have inspired many, including myself. His book on ignorance, uh, for those who don't know, 
is available in Portuguese under the title Ignorância, como ela impulsiona a ciência. Now, without any further ado, uh, please take your place uh, on the stage, Professor Stuart. Bom dia. Very nice to be here. Very nice to be here. I thank everybody who spent time organizing this and, uh, and for this very kind introduction and uh, invitation to be here and talk with you. Um, so let me launch into this because I want to be sure to leave time for some questions after. I hope there'll be lots of pushback on what I have to say. I'm going to talk today about three words that we all maybe implicitly feel we know something about, ignorance, failure, and uncertainty. And my idea really today is to take these three words and make them more explicit, to uh, look at them through a different lens, the lens of science, and in a way to complicate them, not to simplify, but rather to complicate them and look for deeper, maybe more interesting meanings. And I hope, aside from the value of PowerPoint in doing this, to make them more optimistic as well and less of a negative idea because I think within science and through the lens of science, these ideas really are quite optimistic and tell us a great deal about it. And they do tell us why science is, is so uh, successful in so many ways. I think it's useful to remember just as a very quick um, tangent in the beginning that science, there are, there are many systems that human beings have devised for organizing knowledge, for gaining knowledge and organizing it and communicating it. And science is really the youngest of them. We often forget that, I think, because it's so integral to so much of our lives these days. But law, philosophy, religion, art, economics, all of these systems are much older by millennia than science, which in its most modern and global form has really only been here about 400 years at best. So it's, it's worth keeping that, I think, in mind through this. So I'm going to start with an aphorism. It's an anonymous aphorism which simply says that it's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room, especially when there is no cat. And I think this is a very perfect and apt description of science. It's really how we do science. You may think it's a very well-organized, very um, rule-based and driven uh, practice, but really it's a bit messier than that. And we spend most of our time in dark rooms looking for cats, black cats, that have been reported to be in the area. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. And we stumble around and eventually maybe find a cat or two, or don't, and then move on to the next dark room. And this seems to be the way science kind of stumbles along and yet does so very successfully. So how, how can this be? I think one of the ways is to think about the relationship between what we know and what we don't know. So this is a, an old sort of a model, the idea being that knowledge is this white circle or sphere, if you think of it in three dimensions, and in the middle of a sea of ignorance, in the middle of a sea of things that we just still don't know, the mysteries that are still out there. And I think it's important to realize, of course, that so this circumference is what's in touch with the ignorance. It's the, it's the boundaries of our knowledge at this moment. And of course, as our knowledge increases, right, so that's how you calculate, but as our knowledge increases, so then does the circumference of this circle or the area of the sphere, the, the surface of the sphere. And so we actually, in some ways, increase our ignorance as we increase our knowledge. The question is, what sort of ignorance do we increase? Because there isn't just one kind of ignorance. There's low quality ignorance and much higher quality ignorance. And what we want, of course, is the high quality ignorance. So I think knowledge is a very big subject, of course, but I would say that ignorance in many ways is a bigger one because we deciding between this lower and higher quality ignorance is not such a trivial thing to do. For example, um, well, this is a quote from James Clerk Maxwell that I'll start this with actually, that um, perhaps the greatest physicist between uh, Newton and Einstein who said, thoroughly conscious ignorance is the prelude to every real advance in science. And it's this idea of thoroughly conscious ignorance, not simple, I don't know, not simple uh, doubt or things like that, but a very conscious kind of ignorance. And so this I, I would, I'm going to say this because we have Lenin and, and Dr. Lenin and Dr. Pasternak in the audience in particular, but I want to just briefly mention agnotology. This is a study, uh, a field that was developed by, um, by 
a couple of sociologists that I'm aware of, he would know much more about this than I do actually, uh, Proctor and his wife, uh, Schwa Sh Sh I, I never can pronounce her last name. How do you say it? Schiebinger, Schiebinger, Landa Schiebinger, um, and now carried on by uh, uh, Nomi Oreskes and many other people. And it's the political use of ignorance to create doubt where none really exists. So, for example, um, Proctor and Schiebinger uh, wrote a book called Agnotology and another one that detailed the tobacco industry's uh, spreading of doubt and, and ig quote, ignorance as a method of not um, not instituting regulations about smoking and so forth and its ill effects on health. And more recently, Naomi Oreskes in this book, Merchants of Doubt, which I highly recommend, details again this sort of nefarious use of ignorance. And of course, a, a very classic sort of a case of this is in the 1950s and 60s, this sort of advertisement for smoking was very common if we look at it in a little more detail even. This is about doctors who smoke. Uh, more doctors smoke camel than any other cigarette. And when you look at it, you look at this first part, this little child is saying, I'm going to go to 100 years old. And um, it says it's a fact, a warm, wonderful fact that this little child, maybe even your own child, will go become much older than her mother and even her grandmother and so forth. And that, um, and that not only will she have a longer life, but a healthier life. And that this is, of course, uh, thanks to medical science, to your doctor and others like him that are toiling ceaselessly. And then, of course, at the bottom, we find out that this doctor smokes camels. And again, this says, I don't know how well you can read this, it's a little small, but not one but three outstanding independent research organizations conducted this survey asking over 113,000 doctors to name the brand of cigarette that they prefer. Of course, what it doesn't tell you is how many of these doctors actually smoked at all. So it could very well be that of 113,000 doctors, only 100 of them actually smoked cigarettes, 10 of them smoked camels, and the other 90 were spread out over the other 15 or 20 brands. And so this is correct. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette, but it amounts to maybe 10 out of 113,000. We never know. So it's this sort of disinformation, this kind of misinformation or nefarious tweaking of the information that, that is often so dangerous. And of course, we see it in a lot of other places as well with all of these sorts of various um, um, uh, attempts at science, what we would often call pseudoscience. I think one of the most interesting things about pseudoscience, if you will, just to take a brief tangent on this, is the notion that it imitates science. All of these, all of these ideas here, uh, all, all of these fields, if you want to call them that, are, are people who imitate science, and that kind of recognizes the true value, the power of science. Now, they don't do science, but as they say, imitation is the serious form of flattery. So we should, to some extent, be flattered by this in spite of the fact that it's a bit dangerous here and there. This is the kind of ignorance that I am talking about, as personified best by uh, Marie Curie, who, after receiving her second graduate degree, so it's not like she didn't know very much, she knew a great deal, wrote in a letter to her brother, one never notices what has been done. One can only see what remains to be done. And I think it's the what remains to be done that's the kind of ignorance that, that I'm really interested in talking about and examining in some greater detail. I have to say, I, I, I always have to comment on this picture of of Professor Curie because I'm, I'm of the belief that that glow behind her is actually not a photographic effect. I, I think it's the real thing. Um, she's, <laughs> she really took some, a great deal of courage to do the work she did. Uh, 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 courage is something we don't often associate with scientific work, but it's important and is, and is often actually a crucial part of scientific work. Indeed, her notebooks and, um, and papers and so forth are today stored in a lead-lined vault in the basement of the Bibliothèque Française. And if you're a scholar and you want to work on these papers, you have to put on a radiation hazmat suit because they're still hot after all these years. And of course, I think she knew precisely what the story was. So I think our common notion is that we begin without knowledge and then we do some things, we read books, we try experiments, we do whatever, and, and we gain some knowledge. But I think we, we often don't think enough about what we do then with that knowledge. And I would say what we do with that knowledge is actually, if you will, not just increase our ignorance, but develop a better, a more sophisticated ignorance, or if you will, better and more sophisticated questions. And so we may not know anything more, but we know more about what we don't know. We have a much better question than we started out with.
And this is always the purpose, I think, of working, especially in science. I'll bring up um, this fellow here. This is I.I. Rabi, Isidore Rabi, who won, he was a professor of physics at Columbia University, in fact, was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1944 for his work on nuclear magnetic resonance, which is still a very important technique in chemistry, as many of you probably know, and of course became the medical tool, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which is a crucial diagnostic tool in medicine. And uh, Robbie, I never knew him. He passed away before I came to Columbia, but I do know several of his colleagues who were still alive, at least a few years ago. Who, and one of the stories he loved to tell was when he was a young, I think it's important to say a young immigrant child growing up on the Lower East Side of New York, he and his friends would come home from school and their mothers would all ask them how they, what they learned today in school. But he said his mother, Mrs. Robbie, always said to him, so Isidore, did you ask any good questions today? And I think Mrs. Robbie had the right idea, um, and Isidore went on to win the Nobel Prize. His friends may have done all right as well, but I still think this is, and he claimed himself this was what led to his work and, and his work in science. So did you ask any good questions today is a question we should ask ourselves at the end of, of every day. So how do we do this search for better ignorance? I mean, how do we actually do this? And I'm going to borrow a phrase called negative capability. This may sound a bit odd, almost like an oxymoron, negative capability. But I take the phrase from the somewhat dreamy-eyed poet John Keats, who also, in a letter to his brother, said he defined this idea of negative capability as when a man, today we would say a person, I hope, when a person is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And he saw this as the ideal creative state for the literary mind. I would say it's the ideal creative state for any mind, but my interest is in the scientific mind. And it's this notion of being patient with mystery, with doubt, and with uncertainty. Yes, we do reach after fact and reason, but not irritably, if you will. Um, and to develop this negative capability, this appreciation for the mysteries and the doubts and the uncertainties. And this is where you find the most creative work going on for yourself and, and for others. Um, a similar statement was made by Erwin Schrodinger, a famous physicist who knew something about cats or, or didn't, as the case may be, I suppose, um, in which he said, in an honest search for knowledge, you quite often have to abide by ignorance for an indefinite period. And this ability to abide by ignorance, to be patient with ignorance, is, I think, a, just a very crucial uh, capability that we can develop. We don't develop it typically, but we can and should develop it. Not only among scientists, but of course among the public and their thinking about science as well. So, all right, so, so we've talked about ignorance briefly, but, but I think I've covered the major points. And that's, so the unknown, I think we all agree, is where science wants to focus its energies. But what about the unknown unknown? You know, the stuff we don't really even know we don't know. How do we get to that? I mean, that's the really deep level of ignorance. But we don't even know we don't know. How can we get to this level? How can we find this? And I would say the best portal for entering that level of ignorance is curiously failure. That um, is a quote from Benjamin Franklin, arguably the first scientist in the United States, who says, perhaps the history of errors of mankind, all things considered, are more valuable and interesting than that of their discoveries. Because after all, truth is relatively narrow and simple. But screwing up, oh my goodness, you can do that in an infinite number of ways, and many of them will turn out to be more interesting than the simple truth or fact of the matter. And so I think failed, but again, failure, I, I want to kind of complicate that idea and take it away from, from the more common ideas about failure, the self-help ideas about failure, one of which, so here's some common phrases, none of which is what I mean by failure. Success is learning to fail again and again with no lack of enthusiasm. This is often credited to Winston Churchill, although there's no actual evidence he ever said it. But he, he didn't, insisted he didn't say it. Fail hard, fail fast. This is a, a kind of a motto in the tech industry these days, although they don't really abide by this. They don't really use it. They just say it. Uh, I've discovered 10,000 ways that don't work. That's actually Thomas Edison did say that about the light bulb which is interesting because we now use the idea of a light bulb, click is an idea that comes on, right? But he actually claims he discovered 10,000 ways it didn't work before he came up with the one that did. Failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. This actually, I actually got this on a, on a, in a fortune cookie in a Chinese restaurant in New York, so <laughs> that meant something. 
failure is opportunity in disguise. This is one of my favorites. This is um, this was a famous actress whose name has just slipped right through my head. Gloria Swanson, famous actress who said, "If you're 40 years old and never had a failure, you've been deprived." I'm not really sure what she meant by that, but I find it quite intriguing somehow or another. In spite of all these sort of self-help ideas about failure, which I think are important when you're talking to someone on the phone who's just had a terrible failure in business or love or sports or something, and you can use these things, it's not the sort of failure that I think we're interested in in science. Rather, I'd say, I'm going to use a quote from the always enigmatic uh, writer Gertrude Stein, who said, a real failure does not need an excuse. It is an end in itself. This is a very interesting idea, the notion of failure that doesn't need any kind of an excuse. Oh, I'm sorry, I screwed up. I'll try not to do that again, blah, blah, blah. You know, It is an end in itself. What is a failure that is an end in itself? It's the notion that failure is not only valuable retrospectively because it results in some eventual success or led to an unexpected discovery or something like that. That's all fine. But they're not a requirement for failure to be valuable. Failure can be valuable as an end in itself. It's integral to the process of science. It can't be left out or avoided. And it, it can be utilized and it actually can be improved. There's another phrase I like by Samuel Beckett, equally enigmatic, who says, ever tried, ever failed. No matter, try again, fail again. This sounds like the common thing about failure. And then he says at the end, fail better. Remarkable, fail better. Not try again, succeed eventually, but fail better. Are there ways to fail better? And I, I think there are, and, and it's what we should be thinking about as scientists. So we might ask a couple questions about failure um, if we think it's valuable, like how much failure? Can you fail 100% of the time? Probably not the best idea, but I think we regularly underestimate the amount of failure that's acceptable and even valuable. I'll use one simple example from the natural world, if you will, from evolution. These animals are the top of the food chain. They are evolution's winners, if you will, right? And every one of them is the king or queen of its particular niche. Um, and you might think, as I did for many years, that any time they get a little hungry, they just go out and bag a snack of some sort, you know, a rabbit or a lamb or whatever it is they're, they come across, and they just go find water fish, et cetera, et cetera. But in point of fact, if you look into the predator-prey literature, which is rather extensive, in fact, you find that these animals are actually successful on fewer than 25% of their attempts. 75% of the time, they do not manage to bag the animal that they're after, which is why there's still so many prey animals out there in the world, I think, because their lack of success. So, so here are these animals that are at the very top of the food chain, and yet they fail three quarters of the time. And so apparently you can make a pretty good living failing at a fairly high rate. Um, so that's one example of that. There are many I could go into, but I'll leave it at that one. You might also ask how big a failure is acceptable. Well. How about a debacle? I mean, that's about as big a failure as you can imagine, right? In its current usage, it's an unmitigated disaster, a total failure. But the word has an interesting etymology. So it comes from the, uh, an ancient French word, debacle, which is not so much in current use, but it was originally a nautical term, which meant to free or unbar or unleash. It was about breaking up ice, so breaking up something solid um, ice breaking, right, to breaking up something solid to provide new pathways. Well, that doesn't sound so uninteresting all of a sudden, does it? Um, this is kind of what, what we do, isn't it? And, and indeed, we, we often think that creativity arises by associating new ideas, but it may be that dissociating ideas that have been too long together could be even a more powerful way uh, to be creative and to, and to find new things out. In fact, I'll quote here the philosopher Ortega y Gasset, a Spanish philosopher, in a book called The Revolt of the Masses, in which he claims that it costs more to dissociate ideas than to associate them. Things that we just take for granted. They've always been together. We always think of them as working together or something. And sometimes you really have to break them apart. Indeed, we want to have what we call a breakthrough. So, so it's rather interesting that we can actually, I think, have fairly large failures and break things up considerably before we reach catastrophic levels. So of course we'd like to avoid a catastrophe, I agree. But I think we can go pretty far with failure before we get to catastrophic levels. And it's one of the great abilities of science for scientists to fail in non-catastrophic ways where failure is still a valuable part of the thing.
So I'm going to leave you with these two key ideas about ignorance and failure before we go on to uncertainty. One, I think, is negative capability. Now, these are the two things I'd like you to most remember about what I, I think is important about ignorance and failure. For ignorance, it's negative capability, this idea of remaining in doubt and uncertainty, of having patience, like courage, a term that is not often enough associated with science. We tend to believe that scientific discoveries are just pouring out of the place um, like crazy because every day we read in the newspaper some new discovery, but we forget that there are thousands of laboratories, maybe hundreds of thousands of laboratories working away every day, and so they don't happen so quickly. And we forget that patience is a crucial part of the scientific process. So patience with mystery and ignorance. And that failure is an end in itself that it uh, should be valued as integral to the process and that one can learn to fail better. So not, a, not avoidable. All right, so we've checked off ignorance, <laughs> checked off failure, um, and now we get to uh, uncertainty. So I know we all believe that we live in very uncertain times, and indeed we do live in uncertain times, but I think we may also have to recognize that people almost always believe they live in uncertain times and that there have been times in human history where there's been greater uncertainty than what we face today with more tragic consequences often because these critters used to roam around and you know camouflage and all the rest of that and so everyday uncertainty is really is, is in many ways part of what we do and in, and in many areas we actually enjoy uncertainty so for example in poker or gambling of any sort, roulette and sporting competitions. Um, we, we don't want to know the outcome, right? We, we want to have a certain level of uncertainty. And I, I suspect there's nobody in this room who really would like to know the exact time and date of their death, even though there will be an exact time and date. We prefer to be a bit un uncertain about this. Um, so, so, you know, for all of these things, we have a, a thing called a... Um, what do they call it? A spoiler alert, I believe. A spoiler alert. So, you know, if you're in a time zone where the Olympics are occurring somewhere else and they're all done by the time you're awake to watch them or they get on TV here, they, they hide the results from you so that there are these... So we maintain uncertainty. We want to maintain this uncertainty. And, and the difference, however, I think is between this and scientific uncertainty that in the end, these things will all finally resolve. I mean, the hand will be shown, the roulette ball falls, the competition is over and the score is known. And unfortunately, at some point, there will be a certificate somewhere with your name on it and the time and date of your death. Um, science, I think, has a kind of a grander uncertainty about it. Um, there may be no ultimate solution, no lasting resolution, uh, no guaranteed final or complete answer, or certainly no final solution, a word we should all be concerned about, right? An idea we should be concerned about. Um, progress, I think, lies in uncertainty. Immutable facts are actually an impediment to progress. It's the unknown that, that's where progress occurs, as we've talked about earlier. Um, so the, the question is not how we become certain, but actually how we get on so successfully while accepting uncertainty, because science has been a very successful uh, um, uh, endeavor in so many areas, and yet we do it in the face of tremendous uncertainty and a certain amount of doubt as well. So I think science progresses what we need to realize from what's called provisional belief to provisional belief. That is, something is true enough. It's not perfectly true, it's not final, but it's true enough. It's worthwhile. We can work with it, we can use it, and, and it's valuable to us. What we're looking for is what I call a kind of navigable uncertainty, and I'll come back to this phrase in a moment. I, I think the important idea here is that unsettled science is not unsound science. Things can be unsettled but not unsound. I mean, if you're at a certain age, you probably take blood pressure medicine. Now, we don't know everything there is to know about blood pressure or its regulation, and there are a couple kinds of medicines that have been developed over the years for control of blood pressure. There are likely to be better ones coming along, but I can tell you personally, the one I'm taking works quite well, and I'm very happy with it. And I intend to keep taking it, even though we don't understand exactly how it works or exactly how blood pressure works or any of those things. But we will. We will because people will continue to work on this. So I think this is a very important idea. In science, which is not the same as everywhere else, but in science, revision is a victory. It's not a sense of defeat. That's what we do in science. We revise constantly. Let me go back to this uh, idea of 
navigable certainty or come to it. Um, I would say there, there was that uncertainty in science became extremely important actually with Darwin, I, who I think we all recognize as the father of modern biology, but I also would say Darwin sort of started a second scientific revolution because science had become very deterministic. Um, Laplace famously said that if I knew where all the molecules in the room were now and I applied all of Newton's laws and the other laws of force and so forth and I had a sufficient intellect, which we would today call computing power, then I could tell you where everything was 10 minutes ago and where it will be in 10 minutes and for the rest of time because it's all set up. Everything follows rules and laws. This determinism is actually not a very optimistic idea if you work it out to the final kind of where it is that eventually we'll just know everything and then we can, we can quit. And I think what Darwin showed was, along with, with Wallace of course, that you can, you can develop a high degree of complexity and organization from essentially irreducibly random process natural uh, uh, mutation and a feedback loop, what, what he called natural selection, not having the word feedback loop available to him at the time, I suppose. But even natural selection is a fairly random process dependent on all kinds of environmental variables, which are generally, if not irreducibly random, so complex that they can't really be predicted. I think Darwin himself, so actually Darwin took a lot of a lot of heat, not so much from biologists or religion, which is a common idea, but actually from the physics and chemistry community. So um, John Herschel, a famous astronomer at the time, derided evolution as the law of higgledy-piggledy. Ironically, that's actually a perfect description of evolution, but I don't think that's what he meant by it. Um, uh, William Yule, a very famous scientist, the head of the British Academy of, uh, of Science, and actually the man who invented the word science in the 1800s, scientist, invented the, the term scientist in the 1800s, felt that the absence of teleology or purpose in Darwin's ideas was just unacceptable. Uh, Lord Kelvin, a very famous physicist, believed that, or, that evolution couldn't be true because he estimated the age of the Earth to be only between 200 and 400,000 years old. I mean, wildly wrong as it turned out, but this was a legitimate estimate Unfortunately, he didn't know about radiation, so he couldn't account for that. It was just based on the cooling of the Earth. And it was generally well accepted. And even Darwin died being quite worried about the fact that the Earth might not have been old enough to support his evolutionary th theory. Um, and more recently, an astronomer, Fred Hoyle, who's a little bit of a weirdo anyway, but he compared evolution to a tornado ripping through a junkyard and assembling a 747. It's a little crazy, too, um, because it takes a little bit more time than a tornado ripping through a, jump, a junkyard. In any case, I think even Darwin recognized that, um, that there was something new here, because the, this is the last line of Origin of Species, this, the famous book, in which he says, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that, these are my... Um, uh, italics, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, so he understood there were fixed laws about certain things, in particular in physics and so forth, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. And so even I think Darwin saw immediately the, the difference between this deterministic view of the world and this somewhat more... Um, random, uncertain view of the world that nonetheless could result in complexity and organization. And I think it's this idea of navigable uncertainty then that we, that we, that we are now faced with a world that is fundamentally and irreducibly random and uncertain. On top of that, there are, there's a layer of certainty. There are places where we can be certain. There are limited areas where certainty will work and we should use them, but we can use uncertainty because it's there. Um, so you get chaos theory and complexity theory and, of course, quantum mechanics and, now, and biology, beginning biology with, with Darwin. So I like to use this image of, of the helmsman. I, I'm stealing this from a, um, an author, a British author and artist named Emma Cocker, who wrote a wonderful book called The Yes of the No, uh, which I recommend highly, but it's very hard to get a hold of. Amazon doesn't carry it, much to her credit. I think it's the only book in the world that Amazon doesn't carry. I'm not sure, but it could be. Um, in any case, she talks about uncertainty a great deal in this book, and she talks about the helmsman who steers against the uncertain pressures of the water and the wind, using his capacity to harness the momentum of forces that are in fact outside of our control. And so you think of a ship, you know, and, and 
we really can't describe where the water molecules are or what will go on. The wind is, turbulence is still one of the great mysteries in science because of its high level of complexity and uncertainty. And yet, we can steer a ship most of the time to port, most of the time to safety. And so uncertainty is clearly navigable and useful and, and the power of it can be made use of. What's the problem with this, or how do we do this, I should say, maybe? Um, and I would say one answer to this is the notion of pluralism. Pluralism is an idea that's very current in, among philosophers, but which virtually no scientist seems to have ever heard of or know much about. Um, and not just pluralism, which can sound like relativism, but this notion of value pluralism, which was popularized, not invented by, but popularized the philosopher Isaiah Berlin all through the 1900s. And he's best known for a, a, a book called The Fox and the Hedgehog, The Hedgehog and the Fox, which comes from this phrase, an ancient Greek poet's phrase, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And the idea is to be a little bit of each to some extent. So at the bench for science, we're quite hedgehoggy. We know one big thing. We work with one big thing. But in every other area of our thinking, we should be more foxy whether it's administration or hiring or teaching or any of these other sorts of things that we also do as an integral part of science. There's a fox and a hedgehog. So it's not anything goes, but that we choose more than a single thing, that we don't run off all in the same direction. And some of these things will have opposing, even incommensurable values, and we just live with that. This is part of the, the value of the, the fabric of, of human existence, if you will, in this world. So scientific pluralism, I think, was best in some ways equally enigmatic to Gertrude Stein and Samuel Beckett expressed by Niels Bohr. I, I should say, I, I know I have a lot of quotes in this presentation, and I don't do that to try and produce some sort of authority. I just think if somebody said something really interesting, we shouldn't forget it just because they're dead. You know, We should keep them in the conversation, and we should recognize that this conversation has actually been going on for some time, and our job is to join it and contribute to it and let it move on as well. So Niels Bohr said, the opposite of a fact is a falsehood, but the opposite of a profound truth is often another profound truth. You can spend a little while trying to wrap your head around that, but I think he's quite correct. Only a quantum physicist could probably say this and get away with it, but nonetheless, it's probably quite, quite true. Um, this idea of pluralism was also expressed by Charles Peirce, a, a polymath scientist, logician, and philosopher in the 1800s uh, in, uh, in the United States, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in which he says, science is not like a chain, only as strong as the proverbial weakest link, but rather like a cable made up of many delicate strands, each one fragile, but together of tremendous strength. And the loss of any one or a few of those fibers will not weaken the strength of the cable. And so that's the notion of, of pluralism, I suppose, that I think is important. Um, oh, I'll, I'll do this quickly and then try and get the questions. This is Hasak Chang, a uh, professor of uh, philosophy and so uh, history of science at Cambridge, a very good friend and colleague, who uses as an example of how multiple technologies, incommensurable technologies, can coexist. He takes it from physics using the simple GPS device that we all know about. So of course you use Newtonian mechanics to launch a satellite into orbit, but on board that satellite you have an atomic clock that uses quantum physics to give you a, an extremely accurate uh, timekeeping, and then because it's in low gravity, it has to have a relativistic correction made to it, or it would be off by some 12 or 15 meters, I believe. Um, and so you have Newtonian mechanics, quantum mechanics, and relativity all together in this one technology in the service of sending essentially a map of a flat Earth back to us on our devices. And so here you have these three, or if you want, four kinds of physics that are incommensurable and yet can work together. I'm going to sort of end this, I have one last thing besides this, but, it, but with a story that I think demonstrates this idea of pluralism. It's the story, I say, of my dog. No, it's actually not the story of my dog, although it is my dog, a wonderful old Newfoundland named uh, Orson. And um, the story of my dog goes like this. So young Tom in the seventh grade is given an assignment to write an essay. And so he writes an essay called My Dog, which he hands in. A day later, the teacher comes back to Tom and says, Tom, your essay on my dog is exactly the same as your brother's. Did you copy it? And Tom says, no, ma'am, it's the same dog. 
right? So we all recognize how silly that is, right? There are so many ways to describe the dog. And yet how often do we do this in science? We say, no, no, this is the way you describe so and so a thing. And we have this one way of doing it and that's what we all follow. And so we should take into account the idea of my dog in science as well. Yes, yeah, the same dog. So the questions are, of course, how do we teach and talk about uncertainty to the public and, and in general in education as well? And I think one of the faults, one of the difficulties we have with misinformation and suspicion of science today is the way we educate people. All the, from kindergarten all the way through university, even if you're a science major, most of our science education is mired in 19th century ideas of scientific determinism. We don't talk about ignorance, we don't talk about failure, we don't talk about uncertainty. None of these things are in the textbooks or, or any book. And so for most people, even science majors, unless they go on to graduate school, for most people their last formal interaction with science in high school or college was with this kind of 19th century deterministic science where they took an exam and there was a correct answer and an incorrect answer on which they were graded, or there were multiple choice questions in which only one choice was correct, which we know from life is virtually never true. And this is their idea of science. And then comes along COVID or anything else like this, and, and we say, well, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty here, of course. We're not exactly sure of everything. We, we have much work to do, and, and people go, well, I mean, what the hell is that? I mean, when I was in school, it was a yes or no answer. I got the grade or I didn't. This is what I expect from you. So we have to transition, I think, from teaching a kind of a clockwork version of science to teaching helmsmanship, to teaching people how to navigate uncertainty, how uncertainty is navigable and useful. And there are many ways we can do this, and I'll talk about those if you want during questions. I'm going to end with, a, with this um, based on a, a, a saying from Vladimir Nabokov, the famous author, who said the key to success is to have the imagination of a scientist and the precision of a poet. And so, with that in mind, I'm going to, I'm going to end with three quotes from poets. Uh, one about ignorance from E.E. E. Cummings, who said, always the beautiful answer, who asks a more beautiful question. About failure from Rita Dove, the poet laureate in the US for a couple of years, who says, failure is a favor to the future. And finally, about uncertainty from Basho, the famous haiku poet in Japan, who says, too much mist, can't see Fuji, makes it more interesting. And so I'll end there and thank you all very much. Obrigado. And I'm happy to have questions. I hope I've left time. Yes. Don't be bashful. I've gotten some really bad questions over the years. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stuart, and we're Thank open you. for questions, comments. Uh, uh, do I need to stand up or? Okay, so I'll, I'll keep my place. Uh, hello, Professor, good morning. Thank you for the presentation. I think it Thank was you. very clarifying many aspects. Um, I know you focused the presentation on science itself, but I'm very curious to know about how ignorance, failure, and uncertainty, especially ignorance, uh, is dealt when it comes to other kinds of knowledge, such as philosophy and religion, or theology, or so things mm -hmm. such as this. Uh, I've, I've read recently a book from Professor Yuval Harari, from the, which was doctorate on the University of Oxford. And he said uh, in his book, The Brief History of Mankind, Sapiens, yeah. uh, that uh, religion is opposite to science in this very aspect, that while science recognizes the ignorance as fundamental to its progress, religion claims to know everything about everything, like there is a God and there are some kinds of dogmas and that explain all the universe and all the important things in the universe. So he puts that uh, opposite notions about uh, what religions think about, what religions think about the, the knowledge and what science thinks about the knowledge. So I'd like, if you could, 
to speak uh, a little more about this kind of dualism that he puts in this book. Let me just check the time here because <laughs> this is a very big question, of course, as you know. And I don't, I don't want to pretend to be... I'm not a philosopher or a historian professionally. I have many colleagues who are. I work hard at trying to do the right thing with it. But I'm a scientist, and so I feel that it's most appropriate for me to talk about science and these things with science. So what I'm about to say is strictly an opinion in that sense. Um, I think the, the, the question of science and religion is very complex, and very complicated, in fact, especially the historical versions of it. There are many things about science which actually um, owe their beginnings to religion in, in, in early days. I mean, there was a time when science and religion were actually quite friendly to each other. That doesn't seem to be the case so much now, and we can think about why in many ways. But, but there was a time you know, that religion was actually, especially organized religions, were very busy trying to uh, eradicate superstitions and folk tales and things like that so that they could replace it with their organized idea of God and so forth and so on. And science was very valuable to religion in those days. Many early scientists, or what we would call early scientists, were there at the beginning of religion. The Reformation was very important to science because it was anti-authoritarian. Uh, it's anti-Pope, you know, Rome, an authoritarian uh, stance. And the idea that you do better, that it's more important to do good in the world here and not think about whether you're going to be rewarded later on. And that's a very scientific idea, this industriousness and the renunciation of authority and all of these things. So actually, through many periods, the two have been on quite good terms. Also, I think at least in the, in the Judeo-Christian world of, of religion, it was the first time that we began to think in linear terms. I didn't go through all of this, but, and, and it's a big subject, so I'll try and keep it quick. But, but this kind of, the kind of religion that's practiced most commonly in, in the West, as we call it, um, it, is a very linear view of the world, which is quite different from almost all other religions and earlier ideas, which tended to be circular or recurring. Even the Greeks had a very recurring idea of the world. And you can't have progress in a world that recurs, in a world that's circular, in a world that comes around and around to the same thing again and again. It requires a linear perspective to begin thinking about progress. And, and that's, of course, a crucial part of science as well. Not just making progress. You could say a lot about that, it's good progress and bad progress. You know, we, we hate the bomb, but we love anesthesia, so it, it's never... But the idea of progress, the fact that we can entertain the idea of progress, that things could be otherwise, is relatively new. It's only in the last you know, few hundred years that we've been able to entertain that. And that comes from linear view. So I'm trying to be kind here to religion. I think where religion does deviate from science is, again, in, in notions of certainty, um, which, and, and, in, and in a finality and in a universe that's as it is. But I think that's, you know, for me, it's not as optimistic a view. I, I think of uh, Gottfried Leibniz, who's famously said, that we live in the best of all possible worlds. And he arrived at that idea by logic because if there is an all-powerful creator, why would he, always a he, of course, why would he have created a world that was anything less than perfect? So even though there's evil and misery and pain and suffering and crime, all this other terrible stuff, it's still better than it would be without those things. Well, I don't find that very optimistic. That sort of resignation, you know, that's kind of well, here's what you're handed, make the best of it and hope for the best, because it's, it's perfect, but it's not. And so that's where I think science and religion deviate. So I hope that is some, um, that's just a bunch of things I'm spilling out here. Uh, I'm hardly a theologian. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, Paolo. So, Stuart, thank you for, for the presentation. You made a good point about um, teaching and talking about science. We're going from a clockwork notion to a, a helmsmanship notion. Uh, but there is, is another point I'd like to explore is that uh, academia is institutionally uh, biased towards success. Institutionally, it, it's how we measure success. It's how peer review goes. It's how award goes. It's how career advance goes as institutions. Uh, so uh, I'd like to know what are your insights on, on what would be a possible path to, to acknowledge and reward good kinds of failure in, in academia? Yeah, that's a, t it's a tough question, of course, because it would require really a, a rethinking of so much of 
what we do and what we rely on. <clears throat> and I, I, I think what, you, what, you've, um, what you've come upon is the key, what I would say the key obstacle to making the changes that need to be made. I think, so the, I, I don't want to gloss over the subject and I will come back to it, but I think we've known for many years since at least John Dewey, for example, in the early 1900s and other people who have more recently uh, had a lot to say about education, we, we kind of know an awful lot of what we should be doing in education. We know that, that, that the, the current way we're educating people is not really the most efficient or the best or the most sensible, and it's been around for hundreds of years. So it's not a question about knowing what to do. To me, the question is, what's the obstacle? Why aren't we getting it done? Why isn't it happening, right? And I would say that the key, for me, one of the key reasons that, or one of the key obstacles is evaluation and assessment. You do want to evaluate and assess. You want to know if what you're doing is working or not working or what's working about it and what's not. But we're stuck, I think, with very old tools for evaluating and assessing things like standardized tests and all of this kind of thing. And that's what drives the curriculum. And it's very difficult to change that curriculum until we have mechanisms of evaluation. Now, what are the mechanisms of evaluation we could introduce? I find this actually to be a very happy perspective because I think evaluation and assessment are scientific problems and they can be dealt with scientifically. So for example, I think um, gaming it could be very useful in evaluation and assessment. I've, I ask educators this all the time. So why is it, maybe somebody here knows, why is it that all the kids in first grade are the same age and in second grade are the same age and third grade are the same age? Why is that? Well, it's an administrative reason. There's no educational reason. We know that people develop different, at different speeds. So games, for example, allow you to do that. You may do very well at levels one through four and then get stuck at five or you get stuck at one and two, and then zoom through all the way to seven, because different people are different this way. They have different capabilities naturally occurring, and then they can gain different capabilities. And so I think gaming is one way you can look into this. I think um, I'm always amazed. I love to go to uh, auction houses, art auction houses. We're fortunate to have two of them in New York, Christie's and Sotheby's, because it's, it's more interesting to me than going to a museum. You see great pieces of art that often you won't get to see after they auctioned off and somebody takes them home. But not only do you get to see great pieces of art, you get to see a price. I mean, somebody has actually put a price on a Picasso or on a Cezanne or something like that. And, um, and you go, wow. I wonder how come they came up with that price. And then if you look at the auction, I've done this. You, if you go at Sotheby's or Christie's, like, you look, they're often quite accurate. This is about what the piece went for. Now, some of that is just knowing the market and things like that. But if you can evaluate art and put a number on it, I, th I think you can do that with science. Farmers do this sort of thing all the time. They plant many trees, and then they look around after a couple years, and they go, that tree's not going to make it. That tree is not going to give me the fruit. I'm, get it out of here. And they make these judgments not having the full line of facts, not having everything they need to know, but figuring out how to evaluate. And so I think if we brought these sorts of peoples together, along with computer scientists and things like this and mathematicians, we could figure this out. Um, and we could come up with new methods of evaluation and assessment based on these things. And then I think the curriculum would be trivial to change, to tell you the truth, and our methods of assessing career choices and things like that. It wouldn't be hard to assess them at all. Hello, Professor. Yeah. Thank you so much for the amazing lecture. I would like to hear your perspective about the graduate programs. If you think that we are discussing the philosophical questions about science enough, because sometimes I think that PhD stands for philosophy doctor. And sometimes I think that we forget to discuss those things when we are at the graduate program and we focus only on the technical issues. So I would like to hear from a professor perspective if you think that we are discussing that enough and if not, how we can improve that discussion in the programs. So I, I may be lucky in that I had a very good graduate experience where I, I failed quite a bit <laughs> and was permitted to do so and given that kind of space and room. And I think it's possible that not everybody has that, that it depends to some extent too much, perhaps, on who's running the laboratory and what their philosophy or idea about science is or what their life goals are. Um, of course, funding agencies tend to drive you towards uh, 
success. Um, um, uh, what's his name? Just slipped right out of my head. Sidney Brenner, a famous micro molecular biologist. I had a discussion with him one time about funding, which I think drives what goes on in labs. And he said, well, you know, NIH grants, you know, we get most of our funding in, in the United States in NIH. He said, NIH grants, you know, are made up of two parts. The first part is all the experiments you've already done, and the second part is all the experiments you're never going to do. And that's how you get a grant from NIH. And of course, it's actually quite true. Um, you, you, you know, you get things done and you show them, oh, I got this result and that result. And then you propose a bunch of experiments you could care less about, but you get the money and you go on and do what you want. And so I think that blend is very important. Um, graduate education for me should be an apprenticeship. When I, I, I'm actually not chair of the biology department at Columbia. I'm the former chair of the biology department at Columbia. That's a very critical word when you're talking about being a chair. Former chair is much better than chair, um, as I'm sure your provost could tell you. Um, but when I was chair of the biology department, I used to welcome the new graduate students. And I always said to them, I know you're coming to graduate school, but you should forget the word school. This has nothing to do with school. This is the beginning of your career. You're coming to work here. The purpose of your being here is to become colleagues. That's what we're training you for. You will do work that will be published, that will be a contribution to the scientific knowledge, to all the rest of that. And that's what you're here for. It's not school. Forget school. There's no summer vacation. <laughs> There's no weekends off. None of that sort of stuff. This is a different thing. And I think if we treat graduate education that way, we do much better. Now, will that happen with everybody? Maybe not, and, and that's, you know, to some extent graduate students I think also have to learn the courage to say, sorry, I failed. I, I have to say my experience with my graduate students in my laboratory is the hardest thing to get them to do is to tell you about their failures. And it's all I care about. I don't care about the experiments that worked because I knew they were going to work. And they worked, great. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me what didn't work. Then we can talk about things, you know. But graduate students have a tendency not to want to, you know, they big presentations, and they tell you about all the stuff that worked, and they're not telling you about the things that don't work until they've been banging away at it for a year uselessly. So, you know, I think the, the most fun lab meetings are the ones where somebody says, I don't know, I've been trying this for three weeks and I just can't get it to work. And then everybody in the room perks up and thinks, oh, well, did you try this? Did you try that? Or I saw that once or this or that. That's the interesting way science works. So I think it does work that way in graduate education, but you as a graduate student have to push it. You have to be insistent upon it as well. Very nice presentation, Thank Professor. You. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what would be the best advisory to young scientists? Uh, just to fill small gaps, uh, trying to face um, small problems, uh, but uh, taking the risk of small failures, or have the courage to face a big problem, but have the risk of a debacle, a mm -hmm. big debacle. Yes, so um, I think the important thing actually in the way of giving advice to young scientists is to not give them too much advice. I, I, one of the nice things about science to me is that, is that it, although I think the public tends to think of us as some monolithic brotherhood sisterhood, if you will, or hood anyway, personhood of, of, um, of people who all obey the scientific method and we have a set of rules and all the rest of that. But as you well know, I'm sure, scientists are quite individual and idiosyncratic. Some of them like little tiny questions, but they think they'll make some big result. Some of them only like really big questions, you know, but even though they do sometimes tiny experiments. Some like questions that have immediate practical applications and others prefer pure basic research or what they think is pure basic research. I think this is the nice thing about science. Any of those things count, any of those things work. You have to find your individual place there, the one that speaks to you, and that's the important one. There's no rule, I don't believe, for what you should pursue in science, whether it ought to be some big thing or some little thing, uh, something tractable or something that seems impossible. I mean, different people like different things, and the great thing about science is that we should allow as much of that as possible, it seems to me. <laughs> 
Is, is, yeah, you want to follow that up? Yes. Thank you. So you have to develop your uh, own way to face ignorance. Yes, I, th I think so. I, I think very much so. Some people are going to be more comfortable with it and some people less so. But, but if you're a scientist, you have no choice but to have some of it. But again, you know, people like tractable questions. The, the, the technology is there and other people prefer to invent a technology to try and solve a problem. I'm, I'm good with all of it. <laughs> I think it all contributes, you know. Thank you. Hmm. So I have a question to you. Uh, and uh, of course it's something that we've already discussed, but since you're on the spot, I might as well take advantage of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we talked a lot Just about... Just remember, you were part of my invitation here, so, you know. <laughs> I'm an idol, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we talked a lot about ignorance in science and how your book says how it drives science, and I think as scientists we I'm, all know I'm sorry, that I'm sorry, you talk too fast. You sorry. take your mask down or talk slower. <laughs> okay. No mask, sorry. Uh, so, we talked a lot about ignorance and how your book says it drives science and as scientists we are, tend to be, or we should be, much aware of what we don't know, as you said it, but pseudoscience advocates use these as an excuse to say that there are many things that we don't know, so maybe what they're advocating for actually works and science just still didn't get it. It's still not there, mm -hmm. but it will eventually. And, and some uh, pseudoscience advocates like homeopathy advocates, well, they had like 200 years to prove their point and still haven't. So how do we separate what we don't know or what we still don't know from things that we know already that do not work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, this is an age-old philosophical problem in, in science that's often called the demarcation problem, trying to define what is science and what is not science. And, and many philosophers, some of whom are fairly well-known, at least the scientists, Karl Popper, uh, Thomas Kuhn, um, more recently, uh, uh, several others even more recently, but, but have worked on this problem and largely failed at it. Uh, and we still don't really know what makes the difference between science and pseudoscience in some odd way, except there's, there's, there's a famous saying from a Supreme Court justice of many years ago in a case on pornography. And the question was, is pornography a form of free speech? How do you decide whether it's free speech or pornography? Is it art or pornography? And finally he said, I don't really know how to define pornography, but I know it when I see it. And that was part of the decision. And to some extent, I think we're faced with that to some extent with science. I mean, I know it when I see it. I know pseudoscience when I see it. But I can't really tell you what's so different about it because, of course, people who are involved in pseudoscience, some of whom I think are quite convinced of what they're doing. It's not that they have, in some cases, like agnotology, there are nefarious purposes behind it. But in some cases, these are people who really believe in this, that, or the other thing and feel that they're doing, approaching it scientifically, even though they're not. So some of this is our problem uh, because we haven't communicated what science is, what it takes to do science, um, what the whole structure of science is, why it's not just one person doing this or one person finding that, but there's a, there's a structure, there's a peer review, there's a funding all these things that some of which we hate but nonetheless are crucial I think to to giving science a, a certain kind of uh, gravity so I don't know the answer to this question it's a very difficult question um, and very famous philosophers have tangled with it and failed so I'm not likely to come up with an answer right here um, but it's one that we it's a it's a fight worth continuing I mean I think it will not go away we, we shouldn't think that eventually we're just going to be victorious and everybody will figure out that all these other things are just crap or something like that. And, and that won't happen. They'll be replaced by other things. They always have been. You know, there are many pseudosciences that have, in the past that were science. They were, alchemy was practiced as science. Astrology was practiced as a real science. Uh, I mean, you know, yes. And, and um, what's the one with the head? The bumps on your head. Um, how can I forget the name of it? Uh, um, come on, so, phrenology. Phrenology was a legitimate science. For 40 or 50 years, there were journals, there were meetings, there were courses in it. 
um, peer review, all the rest of it. It was considered a legitimate science until it was not. And indeed, two, this is another tricky part of it, at least two of the fundamental ideas in modern neuroscience actually came from phrenology, which is a total pseudoscience. But the notion, number one, that feelings, perceptions, uh, uh, qualities of life, sensibility, perceptions, are all in the brain. Love is not in the heart, anger is not in the bile, you know, all of these other things that people actually believe for quite a long time. No, 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 these are all in the brain. So that's one fundamental principle of modern neurobiology, and also the notion that certain things are localized in the brain. That, you know, this area of the brain is for hearing, and this for vision, and this one for other, and so forth and so on. And that idea of localization in the brain, it not just being some big, mushy, kind of electrified pate, um, is also an idea of phrenology. And so those two fundamental ideas come out of a pseudoscience. So it's hard to know where you draw the line. I'm sorry to say. I know you'd like to draw a line, but I don't know where to draw it. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, I would like to add something uh, and, and say that probably, I, I guess, the three words you chose for the lecture are very, very well chosen. Um, the value of ignorance, the role of uncertainty, and to fail better. And I, um, I think all of this question about pseudoscience and even uh, you saying, oh, it was a respected science until a few years ago because it had journals and peer review and all that, is very well captured in Richard Feynman's famous lecture to uh, commencement at Caltech in 1974. And he says, um, examples of what I would like to call cargo cult science. In the South Seas, there is a cargo cult of people. During the war, they saw airplanes land with lots of good materials, and they want the same thing to happen now. So they've arranged to imitate things like runways, to put fires along the sides of the runways, to make a wooden hut for a man to sit in with two wooden pieces on his head, like headphones, and bars of bamboo sticking out like antennas. He's a controller. And they wait for the airplanes to land. They're doing everything right. The form is perfect. It looks exactly the way it did before, but it doesn't work. No airplanes land. So I call these things cargo cult science because they follow all the apparent precepts and forms of scientific investigation, but they're missing something essential because the planes don't land. And in that sense, I would say they're missing ignorance, they're missing uncertainty. Feynman mentions that we should you know, teach this more in universities, mm -hmm. that we kind of hope people pick up from the examples, but we don't really you know, set it straight that science is a lot more than just, you know, a list of procedures. Um, the role of ignorance is, is absolutely key. Um, so he goes on, and I think one of the things that he says is something that is always very inspiring to me. First principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you and are. And you are the easiest person to fool. <laughs> yes. So you have to be very careful about that. After you've not fooled yourself, it's easy not to fool other scientists. You just have to be honest in a conventional way after that. So I think it really captures mm -hmm. you know, the words you put, ignorance, um, uh, uncertainty, uh, right? Failure is not here, but in other, you know, other quotes, of other very important yeah. quotes. If you want to be a scientist, one of the things you have to be prepared is to fail. And I would tend to say, you know, if I would give um, advice, I would rather fail big than fail small. Mm. <laughs> yes, I, 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 thank you very much for all of that. I mean, Feynman, I didn't know he actually made up the term cargo cult, cargo cults. I know that quote, I know the story, but I didn't know he made up the term. That's very interesting. Um, yes, he was a very bright fellow thinking. So, it, and Feynman was very interesting this way because he disparaged philosophy and history of science, you know. He said, oh, philosophers and historians of science are to scientists like ornithologists are to birds. It's fine, but we don't care. And then he proceeded to write one brilliant philosophical or historical treatise after another. 
And he's quite correct about the education. I mean, not only do we educate people to believe that science is this procedural sort of thing and not the messy bit of work that it really is, but also we, we tend to have these historical narratives of, you know, uh, of geniuses um, that make one discovery after another, this kind of arc of, of discovery, you know, where you go from uh, Galileo to Kepler to Newton to blah, to blah, to blah, Einstein and kaboom, there's physics. And, and that doesn't take account of all the, the, the cul-de-sacs, the mistakes, the failures along the way, even by these famous people. Kepler famously in his book, uh, N N The New Astronomy, I guess it was called, um, in which he comes up with elliptical orbits for planets, goes over first 40 different ways that he failed to come up with the solution to the problem. So, and it, it, by the way, was a very tiny problem, you know. He noticed that the orbit of Mars was off by, I think, eight degrees or something over the course of a year. It's like if you took your thumb out, it's about half of your thumbnail. So it was eight degrees of, of, um, of error, and he spent six years tracking this down. So at first it was a very small failure, but it turned into a very large finding. So one can't predict how these things go, I think, either. But thank you for that. That's, those are great stories from Feynman. Yes, I have a Hi, question. Bettina. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, Stuart, for your excellent talk and really inspiring and really reminding us how important it is, it is to think about philosophy and history when we're doing even hard sciences, right? I think we haven't mm -hmm. been doing this thinking uh, so much, as much as we should. Um, I'd like to change the subject just to ask you about this uh, strong anti-science movement that are going on not only in Brazil but also all over, all over the world, right? So are we scientists responsible for this as well, right? For this uh, feeling, and how do you think that we can, we should, we scient as scientists should do uh, to avoid that this disseminates? You know. So um, yes, it's a serious problem. Clearly, um, I don't think it's necessarily a new one. By the way, it's not the first time science and society have had a bit of a dust up. So, so we've gone through periods like this before. It may be more serious now because of the internet and things like that, that things get spread more easily, but it's certainly not the first time that disinformation has gone around or science has been attacked in one way or another. Um, famously, Darwin, for example, and things of that nature. Um, I'd like to say it's our fault, and I'd like to say it's our fault because then we could correct it. And I think a significant enough amount of it is the fault of scientists that we could correct it if we could sort of put ourselves together to do it with the help, I believe, since you mentioned this, of philosophers and historians of science who have a much better view of this than most of us do because their heads are not you know, buried in writing a grant all the time and things of that nature, which we have to spend a lot of time doing. So we often don't get the, we don't get the contact with the, with the public, if you will, with the media that, that philosophers and historians and other humanists do who have a great interest in, in these things. So sociologists also, I should say. So I, I do think that there are solutions to this. I think among them are education, that, that we have to think more. I mean, I'm sure there are a number of people in this room who give lectures, who teach science classes. Do you teach the things that didn't work? Do you teach failures? Well, we don't, you know, we use the textbook. We go through all the stuff that that you're supposed to know as if this basic fundamental knowledge is critical. Critical for what? When will you ever use it again most of the time, you know? And you can look it up anytime you wanted to. So why don't we talk more about the failures, the difficulties, the ways we got to this eventually? Um, this fellow Hasak Chang, who, who I used in the, in, in the talk about the GPS device, has a very interesting book called The Invention of Temperature, in which he goes through how temperature, how we learned what temperature was. And, and it was very curious. It's not so easy to imagine. I mean, if I gave you a, a glass tube with mercury in it, but no markings on it, and I said, make a thermometer out of this, <laughs> would you be able to do that? It wouldn't be so easy, you know? Hey, you'd say, well, the freezing point of water could be zero, but when does water exactly freeze? Or the boiling point could be 100, but that depends on altitude. And how would you know that those were different temperatures that things boil that? And so, I mean, trying to solve problems like that, and, and the reason I bring that up is that that changed our, 
the, finally, the solution to those problems, which took many years and many wrong turns, gave, changed our idea of heat from something that flows, caloric, this idea that it was a substance that flowed, to motion, which is all about thermodynamics. And so, I mean, to me, that's like eye-opening. You know, now we don't think anything of the fact that, yes, heat is friction, it's because of molecules banging around and moving. But that's not at all obvious. And it's not obvious that that's how it, what a thermometer measures. It doesn't seem to measure that. And so I think if you ask students questions like this or put, them to those, put those sorts of problems forward to them, the, in the end, they'll learn more, you know. But again, we have to think about how to evaluate and assess those sorts of things as well because it's harder to give an exam with right and wrong questions. But I think that's at least part of it. And I think, you know, then the public, who, as I say, has been educated this way in this deterministic view of science, is un ready to accept uncertainty. There's an interesting branch of, very quickly on a tangent, there's an interesting branch of psychiatry now, which is developing the idea that actually certainty leads to depression. It's a symptom of depression. Now, we might initially think that's odd, that uncertainty causes anxiety and, you know, worry and all the rest of that, and it's bad for you. But in fact, people who are depressed show essentially one of their symptoms is certainty. That's how it's going to work out. It's going to be that way. There's nothing to do about it, you know. And so you have this loss of a sense of agency. And so we may think that certainty is to be desired, but actually it may not be. It may not be, but we don't feature uncertainty as desirable, as the place where new things come from, as the place where possibility exists, as the source of progress. That's our fault. That's our fault. So yeah, we could do something about that. Um. I, I'm not from the natural sciences myself. I, I study law, so I'm more in the line mm -hmm. of the social sciences. And one thing that's kind of always bothered me since I got into law school uh, was really the, well, the tendency to try to have certainty about everything in law. Uh, the idea that often we don't ask a lot of questions. The law is the law, and that's just as it is, and kind of there's an assumption that that is as it should be. I, well, I wanted to ask uh, if uh, maybe you could have some insight about the role that uncertainty, uncertainty has, or maybe should have, in the social sciences. Hmm. That's an interesting question. I'm, I'm not. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, many, many of the words that we use in science, many of the ideas in science actually came from law. So evidence was first developed, ideas of evidence were originally developed in the law and then adopted and changed to some extent by science. Even the idea of a jury of your peers appears in science as peer review, right? So, you know, we, we accept many of these ideas, these tenets of the law in science. But then we add uncertainty to it. And I don't, I don't know exactly how you do that. I mean, I worry about this quite often, or I used to worry about it. I've given up with it, when, especially in neuroscience, because neuroscience has decided that it's going to take over the rest of the world, which I don't agree with personally. So there's neuroethics, there's neuro this, there's neuro art, there's neuro law. And I've always objected to that because I said, you know, the problem with the law is um, at some point the gavel comes down and somebody is either innocent or guilty we're done, right? And that's just not true in neuroscience or any science. And so I don't see that it's immediately applicable in those sorts of ways. I don't really know what to say about law that way. I mean, of course, one of the things we depend upon with the law is that it, that it should be reliable and equally um, uh, administered and all the rest of that. But as you know, I mean, we have Supreme Court decisions that, <laughs> that don't make much sense and that, you know, really create a tremendous amount of uncertainty in an odd way. So I, I don't really know what to say about it, to tell you the truth. It, it's an, it would be a very interesting thing to look into, I agree. I mean, I, I don't have the background for it, but I think you should pursue that. You know, for, for my part, I... I tend towards international law because it seems to me that in international law a lot of the uncertainty is still there. Mm. It's one of the things that attracted me to it is, well, all the questions that 
people have decided are already answered in national law or so being yeah. asked there. Uh, so yeah, that's something that I always strive to understand. Is I, re I remember reading an article one time, it was an interview with an attorney who specialized in um, murder cases. And his idea was, he said, if you're guilty, then ask for a jury trial. But if you're innocent, just say you want a trial with the judge. Because the jury was easy to sway and convince. And so if you're guilty, you had a chance of getting off. But if you're innocent, you had a chance of being convicted because the other side could sway them. Whereas the judge was better at just looking at the facts and things of that nature. So, you know, there's this level of uncertainty when you have a jury. Um, it, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic. I mean, especially at least in the U.S. I, I know it's different in other parts of the world, but we have this adversarial idea about the law where two sides present an airtight case that they both believe, even though only one of them is probably true, if you will, or correct. It's, an, it's very interesting. I, I hadn't thought of this at all, I must say, but now I have to think about it. You should pursue this. Good yes. morning, Professor. I would like to um, thank you for the lecture. And I want to ask you how to know when you have a failure that can lead you to something new or when that's a dead end. For example, Newton, when he was studying groups, like thinking about infinite groups, he saw that you could um, associate each natural number to another even number. So that would mean there are the same a number of natural numbers and mm -hmm. even numbers. And he thought that it would be impossible, that was a paradox, and he gave up on that. But later, Cantor saw that that was right. a fundamental piece for his group theory. So he said the two groups are the same potassium. I don't know if that's the card. Yeah. <laughs> the same size, if they can relate to each other from one to one. So Newton thought that was a dead end, but Cantor saw that that was something that he could work on, and then it turned out to be something great we use on our everyday lives. So how can we see when something is a dead end and when we can yes. work out something from that? So uh, there's, no, there's no prescription for that. Um, I think it's a very, that's a very good story, an example of it, that, that ideas sometimes have a, a time and they, other times they don't have a time. And there are many cases, I think, of, of discoveries, if you will, that are made by a scientist or some idea that they have that they just can't quite relate to anything that doesn't seem to be worth pursuing but comes around much later and then is worth pursuing. And that's part of what science does. I think that's part of the dynamic of science. So I think you pursue something through a, a fair amount of failure, but if at some point it just doesn't seem to really be connecting to anything else, mathematicians do this all the time. They're famous for this. They say, if you ask them how they decided to take this problem or that problem, they say, well, it seemed interesting. It was an interesting problem. So I once asked a mathematician, a woman named Maria Chudnovsky, who was, who was at Columbia, I said, so what does this mean to a mathematician? What does that mean it's an interesting problem? Why is it interesting? And she said, well, you, you come up with some problem and you work on it for a while and you see whether it begins to connect to other problems that people are working on or things that, that we knew already or other things we don't know. And if it doesn't connect after a while, you drop it and maybe come back to it later when it will connect to these things or somebody else will find a connection to it. And that was, that was her idea, basically, and I think that's good advice. You wait and you see how it connects to other things, and, you know, why didn't we know everything all at once? We have the same brain that Newton had. He had the same brain we had. I mean, even Cantor had the same brain, but they couldn't think the same thoughts, really, could they? So I, I think it's a, it's a, you know, unfortunately it takes time. I would just like to correct myself. It was not Newton, it was Galileo. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, Galileo. I think you're right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And something interesting also, also from mathematicians, was from John von Neumann. He was once asked uh, after a lecture, Professor, I don't understand the math. And he said, young man, one doesn't, get, doesn't understand math. He just gets used to it. And I think it's, <laughs> it relates a lot to your lecture and how we just have to accept we don't know some things and work on that. Thank you, that's a, that's a, great, that's a great von Neumann quote. He was uh, probably one of the most brilliant mathematicians to have ever lived.
Um, and yet, he had that idea about math. Yeah. That's good, good to know. <laughs> uh, professor, yeah. I think it's more a curiosity than a, a question in itself. But I, I know that you uh, that you would offer that you offer uh, cl classes on ignorance, and uh, I would like you to talk a little bit about uh, your experience uh, talking about the subject to to students. Uh, what were the ideas of it, what they used to think ignorance is before coming to classes? And well, uh, tell us a little bit about. Um, well, I'm trying, to, trying to make this a very brief story, but but he's referring to the fact that this all of this business today came out of a class that I started to teach, uh, something on a lark. I mean, I just. I teach this class in neuroscience, cell and molecular neurobiology, one. Then there's a second semester that's even worse than the first semester that I teach. And, you know, we use this big textbook. I'm fond of saying we use this textbook called Principles of Neural Science. And actually, if you look on Amazon, the weight, the shipping weight of this textbook is twice the weight of a human brain. The book is about the brain. <laughs> well, what's going on here? It's packed with facts and all the rest. Of that. And I would give about 24 lectures in a semester, also fact-filled lectures, because I think that's what the students are paying for, right? So, so I had this experience. At the same time, I'm running a laboratory. And in the laboratory, I work with graduate students and postdocs, and we talk about basically things we don't know and what we should work on and what's the in most interesting question and how we can get to that. And I find that exhilarating and really fascinating and, you know, gets me in early in the morning, keeps me there late at night. And the teaching was challenging and interesting, and I'm happy to do it. I like undergraduates. I like teaching. But it wasn't exhilarating spilling all these facts out and testing them on these facts. And I thought, so what's the difference here? Why is there, why is there a difference between the way we pursue science and the way it's perceived by students and the public? And it occurred to me the difference was ignorance. The difference was that in the lab we cared about what we didn't know, and in the classroom we only cared about what we did know. So I thought, well, maybe we should try teaching these kids some ignorance. So I offered this course just as an experiment, really, And, and I didn't have anything particular to say about ignorance. Much of what I've said about it has come to me since then. The class really was, I, it was a class of about 20 or 25 students originally, uh, sort of a seminar thing. We met once a week for two hours, and I would invite members of the science faculty at Columbia or people coming through the city or something like that, anybody could get to do it, to come in and talk for two hours about what they didn't know. I thought the students should hear this. They should hear about what they don't know. So... You know, I joke about it. I say, I'd, I'd call some faculty member and I'd say, hi, listen, I'm teaching a class on ignorance and I think you'd be perfect, you know. And, <laughs> and, and, but they would very rapidly realize that they were. This is exactly what they did. And they'd say, so how should I prepare for this? And my advice to them always was, here's the deal. No PowerPoint, no lecture notes. You're prepared. I want you to walk into this class the way you walk into your laboratory every morning. That's all you have to do. And we'll start a conversation. I'll have some questions for you, but very quickly the students would join in. And the questions were, you know, well, why this question instead of that question? Or how do you come to this question? Or what if you answer this question? Or what if you don't answer this question? Or what other questions could it lead to? And all these sorts of discussions would go on. And I found it was very engaging for students to, to think for a while about the fact that these famous professors often who run these big laboratories and publish papers, actually most of their... Most of what they think about is what they don't know. And, and that sort of view into that was all I really wanted to provide. I mean, I wasn't really looking for a, a philosophical, not a philosopher, so I couldn't teach a philosophical course on it, certainly at that time. But that's how it grew. And of course, you know, being a class at Columbia called Ignorance, you know, everybody wants to take it. So it became a popular class. You know, I might as well spend my parents' money on a class called Ignorance. The best part about it was the grading of it, right? So, you know, grades are always a big thing, talking about evaluation. So the students would say, well, how are we going to be graded on this? I said, well, we'll write it. I had them write an essay, a relatively short essay or a couple of comments and essays. And I said, and I'll, you know, we'll grade it on that. I said, but you want to think carefully about this because your transcript is going to read ignorance. Do you want an A or an F? in that, you know. <laughs> oh, that would... <laughs> so half of them would drop the course at that point, I think. 
So, <laughs> so it just points out the difficulties of it. But it was a very interesting course, and I learned a tremendous amount from it, especially about how idiosyncratic science is, how some scientists would come in and talk about little problems that they just were working on for years, and others were just had big issues of consciousness and this and that or whatever, and, and very different approaches to it. So it was an eye-opening course for me. I still teach it. So, and, and it's always interesting. Every class is different than every other class. Thank you. Mm. Well, thank you for the lecture. Thank um, you. Once I, I asked a fine theologian if a miracle, if a miracle breaks science when it happens or not. And he answered that a miracle must, from the theological point of view, must be uh, something that happens inside respecting science but the science that we don't know. Mm. This was his answer. And it's a very interesting answer because it places the whole theology in an orthogonal space of science. It's, um, it, it's something it's something that I've been thinking. Uh -huh. uh, so for, I'm, I'm so. not sure why you say orthogonal. It sounds to me like what he was saying actually is that it's not orthogonal to science, that, it, that it's within science. It's just an unexplained part of science. Well, I mean, is that what he was saying? That sort of trivializes miracles, which let, surprises let me. me better. It's, it's a tentative explanation, but the knowledge that's important for theology does not um, conflict with science because it comes uh, it's as if it were in a in a different space and so um, I mean this depends of course on what religion you're talking about I think as well and what stage of religion but but I, I mean, this was a sort of Stephen Jay Gould idea as well, these two, what he called the magisteria of, um, of science and religion, that they don't really, that maybe they used to overlap a little bit here and there, but, you know, so okay, so now we know that thunder is the result of lightning and it's a result of electrical charges and it's not some god banging on a hammer or something like that. Um, and that natural disasters have reasons behind them that we can understand and they're not just the anger of a deity or something like that. But beyond those, those areas that uh, separated them out, there are, different, um, th there are different purposes for them, I suppose. And I, 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 this will get everybody's goat, I suppose. I often say I, I don't have any problem with teaching uh, intelligent design in biology classes. I, I think it would be fine to do that. I think it would expose it as a non-science, for one. But, you know, we should recognize that until Darwin, before 1859, most of the great scientists who we have a great deal of respect for probably believed in something like intelligent design, certainly believed in a creator. Many of them said science, the purpose of science is to better understand the mind of the creator. They were called natural philosophers, as you know, for a long time before scientists. And so there were many kind of overlapping areas this way where science and religion were not so different. Um, and I still feel to some extent that way. I mean, you know, people say, oh, you can't teach intelligent design because it's not science. It's wrong. It's just simply wrong. But honestly, we teach Newtonian mechanics, and that's wrong. I mean, Newton's idea about gravity is simply wrong. Now, his formulas work. It's a good way of working with things and all the rest of that. You can launch rockets with it. But his idea about gravity is wrong. You know, it never occurred to him it was a curvature in space and time. We're not even sure that's exactly right, but it's, it's certainly righter than what Newton was. We, we go ahead and teach Newton without any problem. And so, um, 
I don't, I don't really, I, in some sense I agree that I don't think there's this, we have to have this absolute separation um, between these two areas. Um, the, they serve different purposes for different people. I mean, I personally am not a religious person, but I, I have no objection to people who are, as long as they don't force me to be so as well. Then again, I shouldn't force them to be scientific, I suppose. <laughs> you know, um, I just think they get more out of life if they are. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is an age-old question. I imagine it will be around for quite a while. But I think it would do us more good to sort of calm it down than keep it going than make these opposing forces that, in which one must triumph over the other. Thanks. Does that, that any way relate yeah, well, to anything you said? <laughs> it's, <laughs> yes. it's confusing. Yes, it's, yes, I agree. Good morning. Thanks for morning. your lecture and Thank your you. time. I would like to come back to the point about uh, teaching and especially assessment and evaluation. Because uh, it's kind of uh, a lot of questions, but I try to <laughs> make okay. it brief. Uh, it's more like, uh, do you think that neuroscience can help us to better access and evaluate students since uh, we have, we need to access and evaluate uh, each time bigger classes with more students. So we can't have like uh, some uh, manual or like handmade assessment tools. We need uh, the teacher's time are sh is short and we need fast ways and accurate ways to assessment and evaluate. And we also have another problem that is, we need to uh, uh, teach students uh, what we know, the concepts, but we also need to teach them stuff that, that there is no right answers, like uh, critical thinking or scientific literacy that are open-ended questions, but that they need to think about, and we need to access how they're thinking about it. Yes, yeah, so I, I agree, it's not a simple question, but I would say that the current methods we're using for evaluation and assessment are not accurate. We know that. They're often, you know, the geneticists have a famous saying, they always say, you always get what you select for, because in genetics you're selecting, you know, you make a mutation, you're trying to select for something. So they say you always get what you select for. The problem is you often don't know what you're selecting for. You know, you think it's this, but it's really something else entirely. So, for example, standardized tests tend to be a better predictor of family income than they do of success in college, right? They may be correlated to some extent with both, but they're a very good predictor of family income, which should not have anything to do with the issue, right? Um, and so that's often the case. So, so even the, the, the techniques that we're using now we shouldn't think, well, we don't want to try something new until we have something really perfect, because the ones we're using now are not so great, right? So, you know, you don't want perfection to be the enemy of the good or of, of something valuable and trying it. I think in terms of numbers and things like that, this is why I thought gaming was an interesting thing to explore. I mean, you can have thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people playing the same game, you know? And, um, and you can let them move through the levels and you can watch how this works and, and managing 150 students might not be so difficult at all uh, with some of these techniques. So, you know, we don't really use, uh, it's remarkable to think of how little we use uh, our computational abilities, computers and, and technology for evaluation and assessment in education. I mean, we're, you know, the closest thing we have is a, what we call at least in America, Scantron. You know, the students fill in the bubbles and you just put it through a machine. What, what is that? I mean, that's the best we can do with all this computing power to try and figure out how to evaluate and assess. So I think there, it just is going to take some work and it's going to take some thoughtful people, including educators and sociologists and computer scientists and gamers and artists and all these sorts of people, curators, who always are thinking about evaluation. We think about it in lots of areas and I think we can bring much more to education. I mean, I don't have a precise proposal here. I'm, I'm thinking about some many things, but, but I think it's a doable project. 
And we shouldn't worry about the fact that we're going to replace something so valuable that it has to be perfect, because what we have is not very good. Does that address the question you, you were asking? Yeah. Sort of? So. Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, uh, talking about evaluation made me think of, or we're talking about, sorry, we're talking about uh, evaluation and assessment for students, but what about how we evaluate ourselves as academics? For instance, we tend to value research and publishing a lot, but at least in Brazil, we tend not to value uh, activities such as writing a book for the general people or even giving a course that is not really about doing science like you did and you have a lot of, of experience doing things mm -hmm. out that are mm -hmm. really outside with uh, the, the usual role of a professor or an academic. So if you can give us some insight about how it is in the US, because in the Brazil, sometimes it's really frowned upon for a professor of the university to uh, do science communication work or do anything that is not considered scientific research. And that's how we evaluate ourselves. So we evaluate ourselves of, for how, how many papers we publish and if we publish in good peer-reviewed journals and we have we so we have age index mm -hmm, numbers mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. how much we publish is that the correct way to evaluate our work well i mean it it's one way i don't think it's the best way it's hard for me to address this in a personal way because you know i'm fortunate to be a tenured professor so i get away with a lot of things i mean there's certainly many of my colleagues in the department of biological sciences at columbia who think i'm an idiot for doing this they think i should be in the lab doing experiments and that's the end of it and there's no more to do. I mean, fortunately, my lab has been over the years reasonably successful and all the rest of that so I can argue with them about it. But both, many of them, I wouldn't say most, many of them thought that initially this was a waste of time. I find in the scientific community these ideas are changing a bit because people are becoming afraid of the fact that science has become um, sort of suspicious, uh, that science is no longer respected in the public sphere the way it once was. And, and there are people who are now beginning to worry more about this and recognize the value of this. I mean, this is a, it's not a very good program, but now every NIH or NSF grant, there are two major funding uh, agencies in the United States beyond the Department of Defense that we don't talk about, but, but the NIH and the NSF all now require in any grant that you put in something about outreach public outreach, how this will, what, what you will do to make sure you are talking to the public in some sensible way and all that. Now, I mean, for most of the time, it's just you put something in there and you forget it, or we hire somebody who knows nothing about science communication to run some, you know, public outreach cafe thing or something like that. But it's the beginning of a recognition that it's important. And I think we can develop it from there. Um, I think every university, every major university, including this one, sir, should have a professor in the public engagement of science. Because I think this person would have a platform. You're a major university, and this is a position, some scientist, and it can rotate, doesn't have to be the same person, but there should be a professor who cares a great deal about communicating science and who can be looked upon to do this work. To be involved. I mean, you know, there's a tremendous field called science communication, which has the, these people publish papers, they do all sorts of experimental work and, and a lot of inter very interesting work. And, um, and most of us know nothing about it. Most scientists know nothing about this. But I think somebody who was engaged in that and was also a credentialed, if you will, scientist in the normal way would begin to bridge that gap. So, and I find, I, I will say, in, a, in a, an optimistic way, I find more and more graduate students come to me, I, maybe because of, you know, I do this and all that, and they say, you know, I, I love graduate school, I love science and all that, but I don't really want to run a lab. I don't want to have to write grants the whole, my whole life. I, I, don't, I don't envy the PI here, you know, running this lab. Are there other things to do? And I try and tell them, yes. Uh, you know, the example I use is law, as it turns out, because in America, fewer than 50% of the graduates of law school ever go on to practice law. 
Many of them don't even go take a bar exam. So they never enter the practice of law. They go into business, they go into finance, they go into journalism, they go into politics, they run NGOs. I mean, they do all sorts of things in society because people recognize a law degree is valuable because you've been trained to think critically, to write, to make judgments, et cetera, et cetera. I think a graduate degree in science is just as valuable. You learn to think critically, you learn to write, you learn to present evidence and, and evaluate evidence. So I say to them, you could do lots of things. I, I mean, we have a Congress of 535 members in America with one scientist who's a nut in the bargain. I mean, how do you run a highly technological country like America or, or Brazil for that matter with one member of its Congress who's trained in science? It's crazy to me. So yes, yeah, so, and, I, and, I, and I'm happy to say that I see more graduate students and postdocs thinking about careers in science communication or just in other areas where they can apply their scientific knowledge in a way that's socially useful and valuable. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Might be slow for some of us, but we're moving that way. Thank you for that. And mm. yes, we are moving, and I think this is something, uh, part of the work that we're trying to do together. Yes. And also, uh, so uh, Stuart and I are beginning to teach now a course at the International Relations Schools at Columbia for policymakers, the use of science for policymakers. So this is something that we're pursuing together as well. You know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that things can happen quickly, that it looks like a big project, it looks like a really impossible thing to do, but that, that once you get started, sometimes things can happen very quickly. You just have to get started and not think that it's too big a problem to solve. You know, that, that it's just such a massive problem that we, we better just stick with what we have. But I'm a silly optimist this way. Natalia, I feel obliged to say something because uh, of what you said about um, evaluation. Um, first thing is there's a project that has been headed by uh, former president of the university, Jacques Markovic, called uh, Metric, Metricas. And um, we are paying very much attention to the Declaration on Responsible Assessment of Research. Um, the university here finally signed that declaration. So the administration, I know this may sound paradoxical, but the university administration is thinking um, and uh, taking that seriously into account. Um, I think when, when we speak about evaluation, the main thing is to know what we want to evaluate. What are we looking mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. right? And when you say, oh, publishing papers or doing this or doing that, Let's not pay attention to the cargo called science. Let's pay attention to what the real science is and how we're doing it and what kind of problems we're actually working out. Some we will be failing, others we will get some success. So we are looking into that and, and, and I can tell you that so at least one university in Brazil is looking into that. Good. And, you know, as I say, it just takes a start, really. And, and if something works, everybody rushes to adopt it very quickly. So a little, you know, a little improvement here or there makes a great difference. We should be very conscious of small improvements. Something that got me thinking was, uh, I, th I think something that kind of ties together the fear of changing how we evaluate, the fear of changing how we teach uh, with things like pseudoscience, uh, which is exactly the uh, impression that there should be certainty when there shouldn't be, mm -hmm. is the idea of, well, if, if a different form of evaluation isn't perfect, then why should we change it? Why should we change the current imperfect one? Why should we try another imperfect form of education if, the, uh, if, if it's not perfect? It kind of ties together with, well, why should we wear masks or why should we take the vaccine if it's not 100% uh, successful? It seems to me like it's all kind of the same problem. It's people that think there should always be certainty. Yes, I, I, I mean, I agree, but, but where do they get this idea from? I mean, I, th I think they get this idea from the media, from their education, from us, 
you know, you have some scientist interviewed on television and we don't want to sound like we're dumb or idiots and I, I kind of don't know this I mean, maybe don't. So you pretend you know a lot of things. And so, and, and then that, you know, that gives rise to that. I, I, yes, I agree with you. That's why I say, I mean, it was a small statement that I mentioned there, but I sometimes talk almost exclusively about the idea of provisional truth, provisional belief. There's a wonderful book called um, True Enough by uh, a philosopher named Catherine Elgin in which she discusses the whole question of epistemology, which is true knowledge, but that doesn't include science. Science does not have true knowledge. We don't use the word true with a capital T. That's not what we're after, you yeah, know. Uh, one thing that I've been in contact with occasionally is, uh, you, you mentioned, I don't remember his name, who mentioned the tornado in a junkyard. Mm. And I, I, that's a common creationist talking point. And it seems like creationists often do that as well. Well, science is always changing, so it mustn't be true. <laughs> yes. And that's always a bit this odd. Is, uh... it, it changes to become better. Yes. So th there's a, a slip my mind at the moment. The, the, a number of philosophers of science have, have approached this problem. It's called, there's a name for it. What do they call it? Inductive something or another. It's the notion that, well, science has been wrong before, so why should we believe it now? But it, it's not really that it's been wrong before. It just hasn't been quite as true or quite as correct, if you will. So that's why I say unsettled science is not unsound science. It is quite sound, and then we, we move forward with it. It's just not finished. There's a difference between being wrong and being not finished, I think. But that's, how, that's a hard distinction, I agree, you know, what to communicate, as crucial as it is. Well, I guess... Uh... I finally wore you out, did I? Well, uh, I, I'm afraid we wore you out. That, oh, you know, you're standing this has been there marvelous. on the spot, as Natalia said, <laughs> um, for so long. No, so, these have been brilliant questions. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, maybe I, maybe I, I should point out uh, something that inspired me from um, John Preskill from Caltech, who said he's a scientist because he doesn't mind being confused most of the time. <laughs> Right. Uh, and, and I guess that's, that's you know, what this is all about. We don't mind being confused yes. because where there's doubt, there's a possibility of learning more. Precisely. Well, very so, well said. Thank you. Um, with that, I would really like to thank Professor Stuart Parlson for this wonderful lecture and his patience and all the wonderful questions from the audience. You, so thank you very much. You've been wonderful. Thank you. Now, thank you. I appreciate it, but, but really, it's, it's been excellent. I hope this was recorded. Some of these questions were really critical. I have to remember them. So thank you all again. This has been great.